So my name is Liz. Thank you so much for still being here. I'm really excited to talk about travel photography and the self-assignment. They're two of my very favorite things. OK. So I first moved to South Korea in 2006. I moved there to teach English as a foreign language. And I was using photography to document my time there and communicate exactly what I was seeing to my friends and my family back home. Things like going to the grocery store or the market turned into an adventure. I lived about 90 minutes away from the DMZ. And weekend trips included hikes up the, the Great Wall of China, hanging out in Tiananmen Square, and walking through the Forbidden City. When I wanted to get away from the city, I went into the mountains of Vietnam and hiked with the Hmong women uh, up in Sapa. This is one of my favorite moments that talking about just doesn't really do it justice. So like David mentioned, I'm from Kentucky, and it's not the most common thing for somebody from Kentucky to move to Korea. So it was really important for me to figure out a way to communicate everything that I was seeing and experiencing and what I was feeling while I was living and traveling on the opposite side of the world. And this was particularly important to me because I come from a really big family. This is one side of them uh, around 1980. Um, some of my cousin's fashion is a little bit better than others. And when I moved back to the United States uh, in 2009, I went to the Art Institute of Chicago and I started learning uh, how to focus on one interest or one theme in my work. I was really struggling at the time with reverse culture shock. And so I used this as an opportunity to explore how I was feeling by going to the grocery store, which was a particularly difficult thing for me to do at the time. I wasn't used to the amount of food available or salads in bags. It wasn't really a thing in Seoul at the time, maybe not even now and especially the choice. It was really, really overwhelming. I also started spending a lot more time photographing the same subjects. So I went back to Kentucky to the high school that I had graduated from and spent time with the senior class of this high school working on their end of the year class play. And I hung out behind the scenes with them during this time. When the recession hit in uh, 2009, it, I was in Chicago still studying, and it hit Chicago particularly hard. So it was actually easier for me to get a job back in Korea than it was to get a full-time job in the United States. So I moved back. And I started my first long-term project without necessarily planning to. A friend of mine was a writer, and we were marveling about how many areas of Seoul we were missing from going on one subway stop across town to the other. So we decided to spend every weekend visiting a different subway stop and exploring the surrounding area. So this is, uh, these are a few images from, uh, let's see, Dongdaemun. And Dongdaemun is a really commercial area it's full of markets outside and indoor fashion malls that are open all hours of the night. It's actually the most fun to go around 2 in the morning. Tons of street food stalls. Older Korean woman cleaning up after everybody. But then going to another area of Seoul, like here is Noryangjin, is very different. So I was also really practicing on how to adapt to what was going on around me. Noryangjin had a beautiful and quiet Buddhist temple with traditional burial grounds outside of it and a bustling fish market. that the sashimi is perfect, so you should try it. 
And Dangoge is a station um, on the outskirts of Seoul where Koreans go to hike up into the mountains. So you first have to pick up your favorite fermented snack. And when you're done, dinner will be wait waiting for you. And this particular area, like I said, it's on the outskirts, so it's quite a bit impoverished, which is really different than what you might see at first glance of Seoul. Most residents live in high rises, and this is clearly is not. So because there's a lot of gear heads here, I just included what I was using while I was there. It's just the camera that I moved to Korea with and two lenses. And out of sheer consistency, uh, after a few months of working on this project with my partner, Charlie, we were picked up by a local magazine and published into a monthly column. We ended up working on the project for about three years. After I left Korea, Charlie continued to work on it with a different photographer. I photographed close to 100 different subway stop and surrounding neighborhoods and had a selected, um, selected works, I should say, from the project published into a book in Korean. And again, all of this stemmed from consistently working on the project and putting it online for people to see. But not every project has to last three years or take up every weekend of your time. I was really curious um, walking by this um, stamp maker shop uh, in a subway stop that I frequented quite a bit to change lines. And I just asked if I could pop in and get to know him, take his picture. So it was a project or self-assignment that really only took about two or three hours. Norebang is Korean for singing room, and it is impossible to visit or live in Korea without visiting a singing room, kind of like karaoke uh, in Japan. And so I was going with my friends, and I started noticing this really fun juxtaposition of what was happening behind the lyrics. They were playing older Korean movies and TV shows, and sometimes they would line up really well with the American pop songs that we were requesting. So I started documenting it. I really liked this Korean schoolgirl who's not a fan of the Britney song being on. And if you haven't seen My Sassy Girl, a Korean movie, I highly recommend it. She is quite drunk in this scene and kind of teetering in front of the tracks. So for me, it lined up perfectly with staying alive. And I don't know what's bringing the milkshakes, the boys to the yard for this gentleman in this image, but I like it. Another exploration of what it was like being an American in South Korea uh, was thinking about how we were turning these apartments into homes. You're only allowed two suitcases and whatever you can squeeze into your checked bags when you move to a foreign country. And so it was interesting to see who was living where and how it was becoming their home. Some people lived with multiple roommates and had couches, which was a really big deal. Some lived in a shoebox and I had to stand in the hallway of the apartment building to take this picture. He couldn't really move um, while he was having his suitcase out in his small, tiny, tiny apartment. And some apartments were so big and so luxurious and Western that I didn't even feel like I was in Korea. So I also collaborated on this project, this time with a different photographer. And when we were finished photographing different expats around Korea, we had an exhibition. And because the theme of this work uh, lined up so perfectly with an expat magazine, we were given a six-page spread in, in the same magazine. So it was something that came from just knowing who the audience might be and how well something could line up for what started as a self-assignment. 
Okay, so at this point, I had been living in Korea for about five years total, and I knew I didn't want to teach English full time for the rest of my life. I was getting more and more into photography, and I was on um, a two week trip with my then boyfriend, now husband, Andrew. Uh, we were in Myanmar. It was going particularly well, and I told him that it had been my dream to travel around the world for one whole year. And I thought, well, was this something that you might be interested in? And when he said, sure, I started planning. And to justify this kind of trip, I knew that I needed to turn it into a photography trip. It would be kind of like a year of hands-on learning for myself. I also knew that we were gonna be moving really quickly through a lot of countries. Because I had already immersed myself in a different culture, so that wasn't the point of this trip. The point was to see as much of the world as I could. So I made a formula for myself. I wanted to work with video, so I took video footage every day and I, I um, condensed it down into a one minute piece. I called it a day in a minute. Then I followed with pictures that I took throughout the day. I wrote about what I did. And it was really important for me to show where we were sleeping because this was not a luxury trip. In addition to that, uh, being asked, how much are you spending? What is this costing you? Is the number one question that I'm asked or I was asked. So I was really transparent with a budget report. And so this is an example of what it looked like when I posted it online in one column. And again, for those of you into gear, this is what I took. You'll notice that there's some lines through some of the items because either I dropped it, my husband dropped it, it broke, or I realized I never use an external flash, so why am I carrying it around the world with me? And these are some of the images that I posted uh, following the formula that I just spoke about. about. There were so many kids, so many more children than adults in this village. And as you can see, it was super luxurious. This is where we slept that night. The rooster is off camera, so you're lucky you didn't have to deal with him. And as of day 52, we were still under budget. So this is what a budget report looked like. I broke it down into each day, and then what was going on for the trip in its entirety. I'm often asked what my favorite part of this trip was, and that's an impossible answer, uh, but I did really enjoy our time in Kathmandu. We were also really fortunate to be there during Diwali. So we got to partake in the celebrations and everything was extra festive because of it. And something that I also want to point out is if something, if you can see a pattern um, within your bigger project, consider turning it into a typology. Because a mandala on its own is quite beautiful, but then I, when I'm able to take a picture of it in the same fashion and arrange it in a grid like this, it's a little bit more powerful and it can add another layer to your project. So most Americans look forward to McDonald's. Um, my husband and I looked forward to Korean food and we tried to eat it whenever we could while we were traveling. One of the more difficult places to travel through was Mozambique. However, Mozambique Island was a breath of fresh air and a photographer's dream. It's one of my other favorite places that we visited. It's the former Portuguese capital, and it's uh, still in a little disrepair, but it's full of character. Uh, He's looking at me and smiling and holding a rubber tire. They're having a game of basketball. And while I'm making these day in a minute videos, I'm using my friend's um, mixes. Who, he was a DJ and uh, let me use his music. But 
we were traveling for, in the end, 443 days. So while I love my friend, I got a little tired of the same music. So I downloaded GarageBand, the app, and luckily I had lots of hours spent traveling on buses or waiting for a plane to take off. And so I just started mixing my own music. It's not the best, perhaps, especially for the audiophiles in the room, but it's something that you can do. You can um, experiment with a different medium. I'll count. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, again. You didn't take it. One, two, three. Okay. He was supposed to be taking my picture. He's not very good. <laughs> so, um, everyone always wants to know, but how did you afford this trip? And my answer is really boring. I just saved up for it. When I was living in South Korea, I had a larger disposable income than I do here in New York City. Um, and I was freelance taking freelance photography um, to a different level. And I was also still working uh, full time as an English teacher in the public school system. So um, we went a little over budget, but the entire trip was a little less than $25,000. So just because I was finished with the trip didn't necessarily mean I was finished with the project. And I wanted to see if I could take anything, any of the elements, to a different level. So I brought in that typology um, into where we slept. Uh, because again, a picture of where we slept on its own might not be so interesting, but when I put it in typology and then organize it into a calendar form of the actual month that we were traveling, it becomes a little more interesting. Um, the blackout squares are because we didn't start traveling until September 4th. And then I took all 443 day in a minute videos and I condensed them into an eight minute short film. And then I was tired, Come on, and I was oh, as burnt out on, as Let's go. my puppy dog when we first got him. Here we go. <laughs> That's it. He's better at walking outside now. <laughs> uh, but I just, I really couldn't pick up my camera. I was tired, I was burnt out, but I still wanted to be creative. So I took a sewing class and an improv class. And I was ready to pick up a camera, but I didn't want to do anything that I had been immersing myself in for those 15 months. So I took a fashion photography and lighting class. And by this point, I was getting interested in um, taking pictures again and being creative. So I used what I was experiencing with improv and this fashion lighting, and I turned it into a project. So I tapped into these improvisers that I was meeting and taking classes and performing with, and I put them against a seamless, and I photographed them while they delivered a monologue um, from a one-word suggestion, which is one of the first things that you learn in improv. I didn't have a studio, so I turned my living room into a studio and I invited everybody over. Uh, you can kind of see the top of the octobox um, in the upper left. And my kitchen table or dining room table is currently in the living room, so I have enough room to take pictures. 
And my Impact Varipole support system just stays there, so whenever I need to use it, I just move the table out of the way and go ahead and pull a seamless down. So these are just parts of their longer uh, monologue. And then afterwards, I transcribed what they were saying or what they said and matched them up with images that I took. Her word was calluses. And because there's this kind of cult-like vibe to any kind of scene, especially in the improv scene here in New York, um, I thought it would be kind of fun and funny to photograph them in a little bit of a propaganda style and put it up. Again, just thinking about another layer that I can add to the project. And then I thought maybe working on a 365 project would kind of help reignite um, my passion for photography. So instead of doing a 365 project where I just take one image and, and do something with it or pick one theme, it was coming up on the two-year anniversary of when we started our trip. And I thought it might work if I took a picture on the same date and then made a diptych of it. So I did. On September 6th, two years ago, we were sleeping and eating pho in Hanoi, Vietnam after spending the night in a Malaysian airport. Today, we attended a Lutheran wedding ceremony in a Jewish synagogue, followed by an afternoon at UW's terrace in Madison, Wisconsin. And while most people might look at this and ask where the line is between the diptychs, between the two images, I chose to break this rule because, again, I was dealing with a little bit of reverse culture shock, and I didn't really know where I belonged and if I was home in Brooklyn or if my mind was still elsewhere. So I kind of liked pushing them together and breaking the rule. On May 4th, two years ago, we visited the Spice Market, Grand Bazaar, and the Rustem Pasha Mosque, the outside of it at least, in Istanbul. Today I took a different train home and walked past the infamous Flatbush trees. May 5th, two years ago, we spent the better part of the day in the beautiful Hagia Sophia, also known as the Hagia Sophia outside of Turkey. Today I did a double take at this peeled paint, or is it abstract art? So I scaled down the gear that I was using because I was carrying a camera with me everywhere I went and I didn't want to carry a DSLR. So I mostly relied on a Fuji X100T so I wouldn't get tired of it, of carrying a camera. But not everybody needs to move to a foreign country for five years or travel around the world for a year, although I highly recommend both. You might find yourself in a foreign country or a foreign city for a few days, just like I was in Penang, Malaysia this past summer. It's arguably the food capital, the street food capital of the world. This was a fantastic dessert, which is probably strange to have noodles, but it worked. Um, but those images, I think, have been done before, and so I was trying to use this really short time that I had to see if I could do something different, and I quickly became really interested in what was going on behind all of these food stalls and stands. I kind of became obsessed with who was doing dishes because it was usually just in a bucket or two of water. Or who wasn't doing dishes, I also really liked. And then I started noticing these bags hanging up all around the city. I still don't know if it's coffee or Coke, Coca-Cola or something, but I started taking pictures of it, and had I been there longer, who knows how many pictures I would have had or what the story is behind these. So if you see something interesting like I do, I generally try to turn it into something more. And now I'm using something that I was just kind of interested in as an excuse to learn more. Um, I really like those vintage postcards that always say greetings from at the top, and I don't know much about design. Um, and I'm also thinking that there's a lot of New York that I really haven't seen, much like I did in Korea, so I could 
do a similar project here in New York um, where I stop in a different area of, of the city and explore, but I can also use it to teach myself a little design and how to make my own greetings from postcards. So my first stop was Vinegar Hill, which reminds me a lot more of Kentucky than it does of New York. And I'm obsessed with the Golden Girls, so I had to take this picture of this autographed picture in the window. And if you find yourself in Vinegar Hill, I highly recommend stopping by the Vinegar Hill house and having their sourdough pancakes. And again, I scaled down my gear because I'm walking around the city and I don't want anything that's big and invasive to the space. I'm also trying to experiment with some stop action video. So I mounted a GoPro on top and I set it to a time lapse. So while I'm walking around the different neighborhoods in New York, I'm taking pictures and I'm recording a time lapse that I will edit together into a short a short video. OK, so in summary, my self-assignments, I've relied on a few different things to sometimes make them more successful than others. I made it personal. I spent a lot more time on the same subjects. I worked on a project, and I put it online consistently. I mined other interests and activities or something that I was doing on a regular basis um, to take pictures of. I submitted and pitched self-assigned projects to compatible publications and gallery spaces for exhibition. I gave myself a specific formula that held me accountable and I knew I would be able to finish the project. And if the formula wasn't working or the goals, my goals were not being met, I just readjusted. I might have stopped for a little bit, but that didn't mean that I stopped for good. And I tried to be nice to myself. I think that we as photographers forget to do that. So I would just take a break and reassess, readjust, and try again. I used a typology. I turned the unusual to me into an assignment. When I was burnt out, I learned a new medium. And I used the project as an excuse to learn a new skill or technique. Thank you.